Seth, thank you for that overly generous introduction. I'm deeply humbled by it. Abraham Lincoln said his only ambition in life was to be esteemed by people he esteemed. And so I, I thank you for your esteem. And, you know, a lot of people consider Calvin Coolidge uh, one of the forgotten presidents, but he was never forgotten to me. Especially during my time as vice president. As Seth just shared, I, uh, the first time I walked into my office in the West Wing, I saw portraits of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson on the walls that my predecessor had hung, the first and the second vice presidents. And they remain there for the rest of the, our tenure in office. But I added a couple more paintings. One was of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who his contemporaries described him as pure energy which I concluded must come out of New York about every 100 years. <laughs> the other portrait I could relate to a little more, <laughs> and that was the portrait of Calvin Coolidge. And I must tell you, my love for Calvin Coolidge dates back to my youth and my study of history, but it was greatly enlivened by the epic biography written by Amity Schles. I believe her book perfectly captured Silent Cal's character, his personality, and his philosophy. In fact, when I was vice president, the, there's a small library of works about and by vice presidents that's in the library at the Naval Observatory. And I remember one sunny Sunday afternoon when I had a few moments after church to grab a book, and I pulled Calvin Coolidge's autobiography off the shelf, first edition, and sat down and read it in an afternoon. And I want to thank the Coolidge Foundation for putting Calvin Coolidge's autobiography back in print and available for every American. <laughs> Amity, your words about him, his words, in a book much shorter than my book, <laughs> um, a lot shorter than my book, Evidence of his brevity and economy of words, or my lack of it, <laughs> inspired me greatly. And I've been inspired since uh, by his humility, his principled conservative leadership that resonates into our time in new and in renewed ways, and by his deep devotion to the Constitution of the United States. You know, there were many times when I was vice president that I, I would look around the room at those luminaries on the wall and be inspired by them. As Seth said, in one particular moment, I reflected on those words of the Bible that remind us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for us, as surely he did in his time and inspires us still. Surrounded by those portraits, remembering those who have gone before, we set out to do our duty. And let me just take this moment to say to all of you gathered here, it was the greatest honor of my life to serve as your vice president, and I couldn't be more proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration and everything that we accomplished for the American people. I actually think Silent Cal would be pretty proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration when you think about it. He was someone who, um, like our administration, cut taxes and let Americans keep more of what they earn. Like Coolidge, we uh, confronted a deadly pandemic in our time, mobilized a whole of America response and demonstrated the extraordinary capacity of innovation in America and compassion that saved lives. And like Coolidge, we got government out of the way, rolled back more regulation than any administration in American history, and our economic policies, like his did in the 1920s, unleashed an era and a period of economic growth, 7 million good-paying jobs, unemployment at a 50-year low, and more than 10 million people lifted from welfare to work. The policies of less government and less taxes and economic freedom worked in Calvin Coolidge's time, and we put them into practice under the Trump-Pence administration every single day, 
and they worked again. But how times have changed. As we stand here today, two years into a new administration, it seems in every sense to have taken our country the opposite direction of the vision of our 13th president and that of our administration. We're taxing more, spending more. Debt is going up while wages are going down. There's lawlessness on our southern border and in the streets of our major cities. And inflation is breaking the backs of families' budgets. Now more than ever, America needs to rediscover the timeless wisdom of Calvin Coolidge and give us renewed leadership that will take us back to days of security and prosperity for all of the American people. But even as we face these historic challenges, I'm more optimistic than ever before. As I travel all across this country, I see renewed energy everywhere I go. The American people look at the record of our administration. Despite the challenges of those final days, the American people see the difference in the reckless, big government liberalism of the Biden administration. I'm optimistic because I know the character of the American people. And when given a choice between more government or more freedom, they'll choose freedom every time. And I'm optimistic because I see this new generation rising. I call them the freedom generation. It's a generation that understands intuitively the power of human freedom and human dignity. And I believe this generation will be the ones that stand on the ramparts of freedom as never before. But I'm here to give them an admonition from my own experience. Because the truth is, nothing is ever accomplished in the cause of freedom without a fight. And so I want to challenge the young people here today and the extraordinary leaders that are gathered here. We need to redouble our commitment to freedom and to its cause and prepare for the fight that lies ahead. To the young people, I say, wrap your minds and hearts around not only the example of Calvin Coolidge, but the timeless wisdom of the American founding. The ideals enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the Republic described in the Constitution of the United States. Calvin Coolidge said the Constitution is the sole source and guarantee of national freedom. And so it is. You know, every office holder in this country, members of our military and public safety all take the same oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. They take the obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And they pledge to well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office they're about to enter. And it ends through custom and tradition with a prayer. So help me God. I took that oath many times serving alongside Congressman Cox as a member of Congress. I took it as a governor in Indiana and I took it as your vice president. And I understood in each moment it was not just a promise that I was making to the American people for me and my house, it was a promise we were making to Almighty God. And I want to challenge each and every one of you here today to approach that promise as American citizens in the same spirit. Because the truth is, if we lose faith in the founding principles of this country, if we lose our commitment to our Constitution, we won't just lose our way, we'll lose our country. The truth is this generation may well be the last line of defense for the Constitution of the United States. There are forces afoot in politics today that would have us 
abandon the principles enshrined in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. There are forces afoot that would pack the courts to rewrite the Constitution. But we must say, as our first president said, the Constitution is the guide I will never abandon and live that out every day. And the American people must know, those of you that aspire to leadership, that you'll keep your oath. The Bible says in Psalm 15, he keeps his oath even when it hurts. And that must be your standard as well. Calvin Coolidge said once, those who want their rights respected under the Constitution ought to set the example themselves of observing the Constitution. And so you must. It's always been my aspiration, and so it will ever remain, whatever life has in store for us in the future. I know I've been much in the news uh, lately, and I thought I might speak to that. I received word last week that the special counsel investigating President Donald Trump issued an unprecedented subpoena to compel my testimony. No vice president in American history has ever been compelled to testify against a president with whom they serve. But we live in unprecedented times. I made it clear then that consistent with the oath that I took and consistent with history, I will fight the subpoena from Biden's DOJ and I will stand firmly on the Constitution of the United States of America. January 6 was a dark day in the history of our nation's capital. But thanks to the courage of law enforcement, the riot was quelled. We reconvened the Congress the very same day and completed our work under the Constitution of the United States. Over the past two years, I've spoken and written extensively about the experiences that day. I'm proud of what we did and the stand that we took, criticized though it was by some in my own party and by the president with whom I serve. But I've also made it clear that President Trump was wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. And his words that day were reckless. And they endangered my family and others at the Capitol. The American people deserve to know the truth of that day. They have every right to hold the president and others around him accountable. No one's above the law. But the supreme law of the land is the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution forbids the executive branch from compelling an official to appear in, quote, any other place for the conduct of their duties in the legislature. And on January 6, I was serving as president of the Senate under the express language of the Constitution. Now, this may seem obscure, but I go back to Calvin Coolidge again. Coolidge said, there is scarcely a word in the Constitution of any of our states or of our nation that was not written there for the purpose of protecting our liberties. And I say to all the young people gathered here, the speech and debate protections in the Constitution are about preserving the separation of powers. We should... Thank you. Our founders did not intend us to live in a nation where the executive could haul members of the legislature before courts to answer for what they had done in the legislature. It literally is a principle that makes its way into our Constitution at the American founding because it emerged from common law, where members of parliament created speech and debate protections so that the king could not haul them into his courts if he disagreed with what the parliament was doing. It is that important. And 
It's a position that uh, the Department of Justice has defended on my behalf on two occasions over the last two years. Let me run that by you again. <laughs> the idea that the speech and debate clause applies to the vice president in their duties presiding over the Congress of the United States was a position defended by the Department of Justice in two different cases involving me in the last two years. But something changed. And the truth is, I, I look at a new set of rules now, and it feels very familiar. Looks like one more example of a two-tiered justice system where the rules tend to change when it comes to Republicans and conservatives. We, we've seen a Justice Department that has targeted parents for showing up at school board meetings. We've, we've seen a Justice Department that's colluded with big tech to silence conservative voices. Equal justice under the law is at the center of the American system of justice, and we must end the double standard of this Department of Justice and their capacity to change the rules. So, so as I did on January 6th when I kept my oath and implemented the express language of the Constitution, as I did on January 12th, when Speaker Pelosi and Democrat leadership attempted to misuse the 25th Amendment in a punitive manner, so I will do so again in this moment. To subpoena a former president of the United States for their duties before the United States Senate is unprecedented and unconstitutional. And I would say to each and every one of you, we will fight this in our courts. We will make this case. And for so long as I live, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. So help me God. As I close, I want to challenge the students who are joining us here today. And then I'd, Amity said we might have time for a few questions. And that is, I want you to make a lifelong commitment to becoming men and women of integrity. You know, there's a common misperception in your generation that adversity creates character. The way my kids say it is, you know, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Well, I don't think adversity creates character. I think adversity reveals character. When hard times come and when you are pressed on your convictions, you will be in that moment the man or woman you've been preparing to be on every quiet day before. So I want to say to all those gathered here who aspire to leadership, use this time in your life to develop the qualities of the inner man and the inner woman that will make you into the kind of principled leaders that America will need in the challenging days ahead. And I'd encourage you in one other respect. And it is a value that Calvin Coolidge and I both share. And that is understand that the foundation of America is freedom. But the foundation of freedom is faith. As Coolidge said, men do not make laws. They discover them. Timeless truths. Our founders believe we were endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Coolidge lived that out in his personal faith and in his public life, and so I have aspired to as well. So to the young people here today, I encourage you to take time in your life to think deeply about who he is and remember those ancient verses that appear over the mantle in our home these last 20 years. that read, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I do believe, by his grace and with your leadership and courage, the best days for the greatest nation on earth 
are yet to come. So thank you. God bless the memory of President Calvin Coolidge, and God bless you all.